Good afternoon. Welcome everyone here today. Um, in a slight change to the advertised program, I'm going to hand directly over to Jeff Majumkalda, CEO of Coursera, to give um, a few opening remarks before he has to head off to another engagement. Over to you, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Lucy. And I uh, appreciate you all coming. I'm hoping maybe I can just get this panel kicked off with some thoughts from the field. Uh, Coursera is a company that is just approaching now 10 years old. It was actually started as a collaboration between two professors from Stanford, Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng. They decided to publish some very popular courses online and were shocked when over 100,000 people from around the world came to take these courses on machine learning. Uh, very you know, job relevant courses that were in high demand but not in very high supply. What we've seen in the last 20 months, at least from Coursera's perspective, uh, I think is a signal of the kinds of possibilities that are opening up in this post-pandemic world. And as Fred said, we, we've seen a lot of pressure that has forced us to change. I believe in particular that there are three things to keep an eye on that might actually be the indicators and the enablers of persistent progress and innovation. The first one, of course, is just online learning the ability for anyone anywhere to learn virtually anything at any time. Uh, we started 2020 with about 47 million learners who are registered on Coursera. During 2020, an additional 30 million learners came to Coursera as their campuses closed. And a disproportionate amount of new enrollments in courses were actually from women and learners in emerging economies. So we see a really big opportunity, of course, with online learning to create better access, lower cost, and, and broader selection. Another major possibility that has opened up because of technology is remote work. If you will, the ROI of investing, for most, of learning for most students, is based on the likelihood that they can get a job opportunity. And historically, job opportunities have been constrained to the community of that learner. But in a world where anyone anywhere can learn a wide range of skills and anyone anywhere has the opportunity to get jobs, even if those jobs aren't in one's community, then suddenly the value of learning becomes much, much greater. So remote work, I think, would be sort of possibility number two. And then number three, uh, the technology underneath that I will say is a platform a platform, whether it's Coursera or other platforms, that platform could be Uber or it could be Spotify, but platforms are powerful business models because they enable the creation of value by a collaboration of a much broader community. It's not just one company solving the problem. It's a platform that allows many different problem solvers to come and solve the problem. And so that collaboration between two professors that started in 2012 when Coursera started has blossomed into over 250 universities and industries who have created more than 5,000 courses. And now all these courses are available to learners around the world. We're now at 92 million learners. We offer these courses to businesses who are upskilling and reskilling their employees. We offer these courses to governments who are doing workforce development programs. We offer these courses to other universities who are now integrating online learning and online credentials to the on-campus programs. So I think that we have really seen an incredible explosion of innovation. I believe that there will be persistent innovation and some of these technology enables, enablers will, will lead the way. So with that, I hope that we can hear a lot more about the possibilities, but clearly at, at Coursera, we've seen great progress and we're excited about the future. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you to Fred as well for setting the scene so well. Um, we know that tertiary education is central to um, economic, to societal, to personal growth. And yet we don't see enrollment rates matching the need that's out there. And that's particularly the case in some of those regions where we see the fastest growing youth populations. This represents a huge risk in terms of equity. Today's panel is going to help us understand where we are now and where we're going at a time of huge change. We're going to dig into how we can scale up resilient and accessible education systems that promote equity. 
And I'm delighted to be joined by an expert panel here today whose experience spanned the public and private sector policy and implementation as well. Let me first introduce um, His Excellency um, Manish Sisodia, Deputy Chief Minister of Government, um, Minister of Education for Delhi. Um, I'd next like to introduce you to Ibrahim Al Safadi, founder and CEO of the Luminous Education in Jordan. I will then also introduce Rahim J. Bat, Chief of TVET and Youth for Division at UNRWA. Hopefully at some point we will be also joined by Professor Angela Owusu's answer, who is um, Provost of Ashesi University in Ghana, um, but she's supposed to be joining us remotely. Hopefully she'll join us at some point during the panel. Thank you. So. Thank you. I'm going to start with a quick fire question to each of the panelists and perhaps I'll go to you um, first minister to say the COVID pandemic, it's catalyzed innovation in the global tertiary education sector and prompted many to rethink their strategies. What is the one main change that you are observing? Uh, thank you, Lucy. Actually, uh before COVID, we all have been talking about, especially the educators and the education leaders around the world, governments around the world have been talking about the future of the job, uh, considering the penetration of technology into our lives and field, working fields. Everybody was speculating about what is going to be the future of work. And, and, and there was pandemic and there was lockdowns, so everything was shut down. So schools, education institutions, colleges, universities were forced to adopt technology. Innovation have, it, it is yet to come actually. It was like I was talking to Jeff, Jeff has just left, and it was like you're watching a play on a stage, and all of a sudden you bring a zoom in camera, zoom camera to the stage. So from a zoom camera, you can't, you can't enjoy a play like you enjoy a movie on the stage. You have to be innovative to make a movie from the same content with the same actors. So the books are the same, the courses are the same, the professors are the same. Incidentally, Zoom camera is added to the whole education system, especially to the higher education systems. So innovations in order to reform the curriculums, syllabuses, in order to change the teacher's training, professor's training, and to adopt more innovative waves, uh, ways to use technology are yet to be evolved. As I said, it's just like Zoom camera has entered into a play, and we all are watching that. So innovation is yet to come, and we all are looking forward. Uh, we all are looking forward how the world actually evolves around it. Thank you, Minister. Um, over to you, Ibrahim. What is the one big change that you've, you've been observing? The real one, I can see that no one can imagine that youth and talent can adapt that fast. And actually, they have been able to, to do something with the, with the pressure of the pandemic and to be more engaged with their school and to do things out of the box because outside of the classroom and to work with other people they don't know. And we have seen a lot of success story from those learners today, which they are doing great impact. I was in Doha two days ago and I find one of my students that he started from Gaza he started with us studying in the school, getting the scholarship in 2018. And today, he is a manager of one of the international companies. So those learners, by having um, exposed them to the globe and a new way of learning, that make learning as a habit and learning from all other platforms, because the pandemic have pushed learners to learn in a different way and they expose into, into the globe today. Thank you. 
you talk there about the rapidly changing landscape, and we really see that about the nature of jobs is changing incredibly fast, and already there is a mismatch between the skills that young people are leaving education with and the needs of employers. What can we do to reduce that mismatch now and in the future? Uh, thinking as well, particularly about the role of the private sector in effective industry connections. And can I ask the minister to take that first question? Actually, it's not about uh, government. The universities have to take lead. Institutions who are providing professional, especially vocational co uh, courses have to take a lead. Uh, for instance, in Delhi, we have set up one new skill and entrepreneurship university. Recently, we, we set up this university, and uh, the main task of this university, of course, is to provide vocational courses and uh, degrees. But 50% of the energy of the university is being used to do research, collaboration with the market, do a lot of market research, because usually we see there are other, there are different entities who do market research, there are different entities who toot, and then there are different entities who actually employ. We have to merge this. So this university is an innovation where university itself is, is, is working with the markets. What kind of jobs you are going to have today, you are having today or maybe tomorrow. So what kind of training you require from them. So we are customizing our courses on the basis of emerging needs, especially post pandemic. What kind of uh, local markets, industry, manufacturer, traders, what kind of jobs are they producing or are they going to produce? We are adopting those, those uh, demands, those needs into our courses. So I think uh, post pandemic, we have to do this fast. Otherwise, there would be generations of gender, uh, I mean, uh, uh, people, a lot of people who are having degrees, and there'll be a lot of people who are looking for people who can work with them, but it will be unmatched. Thank you. Um, and now to Reem, we've seen a series of reforms in many countries, um, as the minister was talking about, to drive up that growth um, in TVA enrolments with the hope of boosting um, employment for young people. Where are we seeing this working? And to what extent are we seeing a shift in those long-standing perceptions around TVET and apprenticeship as compared to, say, more academic um, qualifications, and particularly for refugee youth? Yes, thank you. Actually, this is very key. In terms of thinking about how we can strengthen the TVET program overall, and we know that the perceptions of the Tibet, despite all the, I would say that the policymakers and all of us are really working in terms of enhancing the, the perceptions so as to enhance the access. But we don't see that the tools, the policy, policy really, uh, policy tools are really in place or sufficient in order to make this implemented on the ground. And this is what we really want to strengthen. We need to work all together. So we, these kind of different strategies working and how we can strengthen that and thinking about uh, how we can uh, see it from different angle and how different pieces can complement each other to uh, innovate the education. And uh, there is a lot, a lot of things related to uh, what we can do actually here in terms of uh, looking at the digitalization, partnerships, and uh, especially that we are, for example, when we are talking about enhancing the employment of the Palestine refugees, we, how we can enhance their livelihood. There are a lot of challenges related to their employment. We know that the high unemployment rate, especially also for the young people, which is three times as, com as compared to the adults. So how we can address that and how we can strengthen uh, their education by providing them with different means, providing them with the skills that they need, not from the indifference of even when, we, when they are within working with us and we build their uh, skills that align with the labor market needs and we bring these kind of experiences through the on the job training, entrepreneurship skills. So we open them, open for them different opportunities for employment and we institutionalize labor market linkages because this is what would make a difference if we work together different parties so as to make the different and the change that we want. Thank you. 
Thank you. And huge challenges there. Um, Ibrahim, in terms of addressing those challenges, what are the, some of the most promising models for transformation in tertiary education that you've seen? And crucially, do you think we have the evidence that we need to make the most of these innovations for the benefit of young people? Thank you. Um, for who, Luminous, it's a practical education institution that built in demand driven. In my journey, 22 years, we have taken 200 small community colleges into 120,000 learners. And in the last five years, we have raised more than 24,000 scholarships from 33 donors. And all of them, we have to secure a job. For, for the 22 years, building demand-driven program, we can see the shift of understanding more what learners, what youth can do if we equip them with the right skills to the economy, to the, to, 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 to the whole uh, uh, world. Therefore, I'm going to give you an example. We have 10 schools. I'm going to give you an example of our last development school of Abdul Aziz Al Ghurair Advanced Computing School, where we promote a new type of education, six months, and we're securing youth a three-time minimum wage. And the school has started six months pre to the pandemic. The school has achieved massive impact. We have graduated almost 1,000 students with 85% of employment within three months of graduation. Of them, students we have never seen. We recruit them online, we educate them online, and we give them the job online. And when I look at the result, I was so proud of what we done because I saw my students working with Amazon and al and many other companies across the Arab world from Jordan. What I want to say is that the smart employment and the engagement and a new way of education is working. And therefore, we want to take what we take, what we build into scale. And we want to be focusing on outcome and impact and employment. And we want to be really more demand-driven, agile to meet the need of the private sector and the learners and allow innovation. And make all of that affordable for those most vulnerable and low income, because they deserve to have high quality of education and lead into changing life. For we have me and my team created a new model of education that will disrupt the education system. And we will not need, as Fred said, a lot of policy approval. It's a new way of education lead to outcome unemployment. And from this, I've been so inspired being here in Expo and what, and in Dubai, what we can see what Dubai have, have made to the, to the whole Arab world, the innovation and the leadership and a great, a great vision. Today, I want to tell you that we are going to develop a new solution that will impact millions by outcome employment and will, 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 will create one of the most education technology company that will be built in physical and virtual approach and will be focusing in working in the youth to make sure that mentally and physically and well-being and make sure that we help them how to learn and we push them to make all of that as a habit and with the practical education by partnering with the top education providers and from Dubai to the cross of the Arab world and Africa and North Africa and East Europe, we will be able to hopefully in the coming year, you will be seeing the result. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ibrahim. And hearing a lot there about the need to work together across the private sector, across the public sector, um, policy makers, as well as practitioners. Um, but to think for a moment about the young people, and this is the note I want us to end on. Um, what advice would each of you give to the young people here today in the audience um, trying to navigate their next steps in the current global context? What should they be doing? Um, I'm going to start with Reem for that question. Thank you. I would say to you, really, don't think that things will be easy. Things will be all the time challenging. So don't be frustrated no matter what. Do your best. Continue to develop yourselves. The education that you get in your schools, in, the, in your college, in vocation training centers, yes, it's the responsibility of educators to develop and to deliver the training that you need, but also it's your responsibility to continue to develop your professional competence and be up to date the market is really changing, and it's really changing very, very quickly. So continue to develop yourselves. Freelancing is great, but don't rely on it. It may become absolute. You know the kind of changes in the technology that is happening every, every day. So I this is my advice. Just continue and don't be limited with whatever challenges. Nothing is impossible. You can make it, and good luck. Um, Ibrahim, what advice would you give to young people out there today? Number one, mentally and physically, take care of their health and learn how to learn and make that as a habit. And learning is a lifelong, continue lifelong learning and uplifting your life because the learning and getting the degree and and the, or the master's degree and you finish your education, this is not gonna work anymore. And especially women, we want to see the women leading a lot. We want to see women from this part of the world to create companies like Amazon and Apple. We want to create the first woman in the Arab world that to create that company because women, they have the best potential. And being mentally and physically and learn how to learn and being open to learn from others and engage, I'm sure I'm sure that uh, the women in the Arab world will do something distinguished. That goes to the minister. What advice for young people? Uh, my advice to the young people, especially who are into learning stage, into colleges and universities, would be that you learn uh, and you should have an eye on what are you learning. But while you are learning that what, have an eye on how you are going to use it, how you are going to contribute to the society, to the nation, to the humane, to the nature. How are you going to use that knowledge? Unless you have that attitude, unless you get that a a mindset at the college level itself or maybe at your education level itself, you'll be so confused how you are going to use that knowledge for jobs, for families, for living, for creating something, doing something new, or just surviving with that. So be clear, where are you going to use that knowledge? It's equally important in the life. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I, I don't know where you were 20 years ago, but I would have loved to have received that advice when I was um, starting to find my way in the world. Um, I hope you will all join me in thanking this fantastic panel here for their time today. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for your Thank you.